Hi there, this is my message to millennials about how to change the world. And I would say how to change the world properly. Um, of course, the question then is, well, exactly what do you mean by properly? And of course, that's the fundamental issue. So I'm going to walk through that a little bit. So I'm going to, and I've also got an offer to make to any millennials that are, are willing to watch this. So um, this was triggered in part by something I read recently by Jonathan Haidt. And Jonathan Haidt is the professor of ethical leadership at the NYU Stern School of Business. And he's been a very astute commentator recently on some of the political battles that have been going on in the social sciences, um, noting, for example, that th there is very little political diversity in the views of social scientists and perhaps even less on the part of the people in the humanities. Um, and Haidt recently wrote something, which I'll, I'll put a, you, a link to in the, in the description of this video, where he claimed that universities have to decide between social justice and truth. and. On the side of truth, he puts a philosopher called, named John Stuart Mill, an English philosopher, who said, he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not, does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. And then he juxtaposes John Stuart Mill with Karl Marx, who said the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. He considers Marx the patron saint of social justice university, which is oriented around changing the world in part by overthrowing power structures and privilege. It sees political diversity as an obstacle to action. Mill, on the other hand, according to Haight, is the patron saint of what he calls truth you, which sees truth as a process in which flawed individuals challenge each other's biased and incomplete reasoning and in the process all become smarter. Haight points out that truth university dies when it becomes intellectually uniform or politically orthodox. So I guess this video is in part my call along with Jonathan Haight for young people to join truth university. But there's a problem with that. Because the, the university is where the truth is being sought, that's the university. But there's a problem, and that is that young people want to change the world. And it's part of what Piaget, the developmental psychologist Piaget, called the messianic stage. And there's some real utility in that, because we're social creatures. And um, as we construct ourselves and, and formulate ourselves and bring our own character into being, predicated on our, on our biological uh, platform, our biological being, we also simultaneously have to integrate, adjust to integrate with and negotiate with society, which sometimes needs to be changed. The structure of society has to be preserved, but it has to be updated and improved as it moves forward. And so part of the problem is how to update and improve it without um, doing that so rapidly that you destroy everything of any value. So the problem I have with the Marxist perspective, and I've had this problem with it for a long time, is that I don't think that you should trust people whose primary goal when, when, when they're attempting to change the world for the better is to change other people. And you can tell who those people are because they're always blaming other people and they're looking for victims. They're looking for perpetrators and victims and then they're going off to stop the perpetrators. And I think that's wrong because as Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, he's a great Russian writer who helped bring down the Soviet Union. He said, the line between good and evil runs down every, every human's heart. So the, so the real battle, as far as I'm concerned, and I, and I think this goes along with the tr tradition in which John Stuart Mill is, is firmly placed in, is that to overcome tyranny and malevolence and chaos and nihilism and the desire to bring everything to a halt, you have to repair the fissures and, and, the, and the rift that's in your own soul, basically. And that means that you have to confront the, the evil that lives in your own heart. And there's a, there's a statement from the New Testament that I think is very much apropos with regards to this particular idea. And this is, uh, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is a central text in, in, Western, in the Western tradition. I would say obviously central to Christianity, but central to everything that Western civilization has built. And so Christ says to his followers, um, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye. And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Well, I like that quote because it places the responsibility for change at every level of being on the individual. 
And obviously the individual interacts with society, but the idea here is that unless the individual straightens out his or her own soul, there's no possibility that the impact the individual can have on society can be anything but, but say, harmful in proportion to the harm that's still in the soul. These are important things to know. They're vitally important things to know. So, okay, so, but then we're faced with the conundrum that young people also want to change the world. But that's no problem because I think you can bring, you can bring truth university together with the desire to, to make real change. But change, change, change has to start in the right place. So I'm going to tell you how I think you should change yourself so that you can change the world. And so that the world that you bring into being will be a better world and not a worse one. Remember, remember, you, you need to know about this, that the world that the followers of Marx brought into being in the 20th century killed more than 100 million people, say in China and Russia, I mean the Soviet Union and, and in places like Cambodia and Vietnam. The world certainly changed as a consequence of Marxist doctrine, but it didn't change in, in a good direction. And of course, the Marxist doctrine is, is making itself heard in a massive way across the West again now. So, all right, so what should you do about that? Well, here, here's an idea. The first thing you have to do is orient yourself. Now, you probably have all watched Pinocchio, and Pinocchio is about how a marionette, someone who's, whose strings are being pulled by forces beyond his comprehension, that's the situation of the undeveloped individual. Geppetto, who's a benevolent father, so a benevolent uh, symbol, a symbol of benevolent culture, makes a puppet, his son, and then wishes on a star. Now, a star is something that glitters up in the sky, and it's, and it's, it's associated with the transcendent and the beyond and the divine. And, you know, if you look up in the night sky and it's very dark, you get a feeling of awe. It's because you're confronting your soul, so to speak, your individual soul is confronting the cosmos, and you can feel a relationship between you and, 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 and the totality. So looking up into the sky is a, like a religious experience if, if it's a starry sky. And to wish upon a star is to find an, a light that orients you like the North Star and to pick a highest goal, to pick the highest goal you can conceive of. And so that's what Geppetto does. He raises his eyes above his his day-to-day -day concerns and tries to establish a relationship with the highest of all possible values. And and, and he, he has the most profound of wishes. And the most profound of wishes is that the puppet that he's created could become a genuine individual, a genuinely fully, fully developed human being. And that's what you can wish for yourself. That's, you can wish and, 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 and aim for that in yourself. And then, you see, that's how you deal with the suffering that's attendant on life, because life is suffering, and because life is very hard, and people get sick, and they, they become mentally ill, and, and, and there's malevolence in the world, and there's tragedy, and so life is very, very hard. And if you're not properly oriented with regards to life, the fact that it's hard, and the fact that it's full of suffering can can warp and twist and bend you until you become murderous and resentful and, and even go beyond murderous and resentment to wish for, for genocide and evil, even to wish for the destruction of everything. And so you have to learn how to strengthen yourself as an individual so that you can bear the burden of being without becoming corrupt. You have to decide that that is what you're aiming for, is that you want to become a fully developed human being and stop being a, a, a pathetic marionette whose strings are being pulled by horrible forces behind the scenes. So I would say to, aim, to wish on a star is to aim at the highest good. And the question then is, well, what, what is the good? Well, we can answer that in two ways. We, we could say that the good is the opposite of evil. And I can tell you what evil is. Evil is the conscious desire to produce suffering where suffering is not necessary. And so if you read about what happened in the Nazi concentration camps, for example, or in the in the Russian concentration camps during the Soviet, time of the Soviet Union, you get a good flavor for what constitutes evil. And evil is the desire to exploit the vulnerability of other people, to self-consciously exploit the vulnerability of other people and to elevate their suffering beyond their or anyone's ability to tolerate. And so the good is the opposite of that. Whatever the opposite of that is, the good is harder to get a handle on. But here's one hint, and I got this from reading Jean Piaget, partly, who's a developmental psychologist. And Piaget talked about the equilibrated state and an equilibrated state is like a game that children play where every child wants to play the game you have a little social group and that's the children's play group and and you have a, the individuals within it those are the individual children and the and the structure is the game and it's a good game if everyone wants to play it and and Piaget noted that a game like that will outperform a game that people have to be tyrannized to play because it it doesn't entail it doesn't require any enforcement cost and so I've, I've sort of developed the idea of an equilibrated state to think that if, if you're aiming at the good, then you want what's good for you. 
and I mean good for you as if you were taking care of yourself and, and were good to yourself, who were treating yourself like someone you love, that it was good for you in a way that would also be good for your family. 